Welcome to the Amber Nectar Podcast, discussing the things we think we think about Hull City AFC. It is a bonus Amber Nectar Podcast tonight, celebrating our 200th edition. Welcome along. As with previous milestones, we're taking the opportunity to look back at a key season in our history which was going on this time 20 years ago. The 1998-99 season was, for so long, so unequivocally awful. that City seemed forever marooned to the bottom of the table, set for the indignity of non-league football. A change of manager and a whole new defence was the order of the day, as City sat adrift at the, bo- at the foot of Division 3 in November 1998, and the difference was huge. Now, one of those defenders is, as you can see, if you're joining us live on Periscope, our special guest this evening. Instant hero, obvious leader, uncompromising member of a newly beefed up rear guard. He became one of the figureheads of the season as eventually City saw a route upwards in the table and ended the campaign five points and three places clear of the worst of all relegations. He went on to lead the side under three more managers, including an unlikely playoff campaign, and after leaving the club, went on to lay down roots in the area, making him available to join us live in Les's kit room this evening. Justin Whittle is here, alongside Les and Andy, of course. We've quite a season to look back on. This is our Great Escape special. Um, before we go into it in detail, Justin, given that you only joined in the November of that season, thanks for joining us, by the way, obviously. Um, when you look back at that season, considering you were with us for five years in the end, is that still the season that people talk to you most about? Yes, definitely. You know, once because obviously when I joined where we started we were so low down in that division. And for us to, to come through quite quite good in the end, I think we we did it I think just after Christmas we started to build up again and we, it was a good season for us definitely. And obviously with the players that obviously one Joyce brought in makes a big difference. Mm. And when you look back at it, Andy, before we go into a month by month and, and, and preview what, what City looked like, um, was it always a case, as things got worse and worse under Mark Haightley, that it was all about getting a brand new defence, irrespective of who those new defenders were? It, yeah, it wasn't working, was it, in the first part of the season? We, we, were, we were a soft touch, I always felt. We always could find a way to try and lose a game. Um, and... It needed beefing up, something needed changing because the way things were going, I just think we were going to quietly slide out the Football League. That's how, that's how it felt for a lot of that season. So we're talking the summer of 1998. So let's preview this. City finished 22nd in the League Division 3 table the year before after what was known as the Thank God for Doncaster season. <laughs> Thank God wasn't necessarily the phrase, but we're doing it now. Um, without Doncaster's ineptitude and criminal ownership of their own, a drop into the conference was a real danger for the Tigers under Mark Haightley. A player manager out of his depth in both fields. Um, despite his England caps, he really wasn't a lower division player anymore looking more and more like he didn't care as well. And then there was David Lloyd in charge. I mean, Les, when we go into pre-season and then the opening weeks of that season in August 98, um, hopes just couldn't possibly be high, could they? No, um, things had soured pretty quickly under David Lloyd. um, And there was a real sense that he was taking money out of Hull City and funneling it into the rugby club. Because he'd yoked both Hull City with Hull Sharks as... FC were amusingly known at that point um, and, and so, so effectively they were like one club but it just felt like any money that City made uh, was funneled into the rugby club and I, I think basically David Lloyd had been taken for a ride by Tim Wilby. Tim Wilby had said to Mark Haley, come and manage us and we'll give you three million quid. You know Wilby then d- disappeared after, after Lloyd realised what was happening and I think he was outraged by the amount of money that Mark Haley was on. Um, and and basically it meant that City had absolutely no money and all the players that they were going to bring in were free transfers at, at that point. Um, so I do genuinely wonder at this stage whether it was made clear to Haley whether the three million quid was for him or a transfer <laughs> fund. I don't think there was three million quid there. But what their intention was by, by using the phrase we will give you three million quid. Well, I just think Tim will be was telling stuff, you know, telling telling yeah. what you want to say, but I don't think that money was there. Um, and I think Lloyd was really resentful of Haley's wages from the moment he came. There was, there was a point early in the season where um, Lloyd, two days after he'd said, we need the fans to get behind the players, he absolutely slagged the players off and said, you know, that they're the highest paid players in the division. They weren't the highest paid players in the division. There might have been if you added the manager's wages, yeah. um, because he was a player manager. But that was a, an intensely unfair thing to say. I mean, Dwayne Darby left 
um, because he'd been offered less money than before. You know, we weren't an attractive proposition at that point. Players weren't beating the door down to join Hull City because we were such a well-paid club. It, it just—it was an unfair thing to say, and and it was pretty clear by that point Lloyd wanted out, and mm. and the fans mm. uh, later started to turn the heat up on him to sort of advance his exit. Well, lots of players you mentioned, Dwayne Derby, though, were released in the summer by City by Haitley, Ian Wright, Adam Lowthorpe, Antonio Doncel, Scott Thompson, amongst many others. The only player who came in under Haitley that summer was Neil Whitworth. Um, meanwhile, you were at Stoke City. Now, what was your situation like at the beginning of that season as a, as a Stoke player in the summer of '98? I was. I remember there was a grand that took over. I was a fringe player, so I was. I was in and out. So I was. I was. It was okay. I was enjoying it. You know, I was. He, he went three. You know, obviously when I grand up, played three centre halves. So I was. You know, me being a centre half, I had more of a chance of playing as a three mm. than, as opposed to two. So I was. You know, I was playing quite regular at the start of the season but obviously when they started to get a set of team I started to figure on the bench a lot more and then play a bit part so when we get to talking about November yeah. we'll talk about the circumstances of you arriving but did you want to go in the summer of 98 and at what point if not then did you think maybe it's probably best if I find a new club no not, not at that point definitely not because um, we've just been obviously relegated the season before under Various managers. Yeah, you had a lot of managers in quick succession. <laughs> no, yeah, I think I think the last one being Chris, I think it was Chris Kamara. Chris Kamara. And Back then, in the days when cuddly Chris Kamara off um, well, television's goals on Sunday was a football manager. Yeah. Yeah, it was Chris Kamara, but he, you know it was every time we went out with a different team every every game we had a, we had a different team because it was, it was we were so desperate for points. Mm. But it just it just didn't happen. So unfortunately, we got relegated that season, and then obviously. Brian Little came in, had a good pre-season, felt well, and you know, and just it just progressed. I thought, okay, yeah, it's not a problem. I'm a bit part player, but I was playing more often than I wasn't at that point. Well, a, a big change in your uh, professional circumstances would come within a couple of months. But let's let's go to August '98 now, Andy. Um, one win, one draw, three defeats was how it started for City in the league. The win was the fourth of those games. <laughs> Um, it was against Peterborough at home, and Mark Hakeley scored the penalty that won City the match 1-0. Yeah, the, that was a surprise, because Peterborough were a pretty big fish in that very small pond at the time. They'd, they'd, they'd had a few good seasons, and to beat them 1-0, we were shipping goals a lot, so the, the clean sheet was welcome. The Hakeley penalty, I seem to remember, was a pretty scruffy uh, penalty that could have been saved. However... It did. I don't know if it felt like a turning point at the time because we'd had a rotten start to the season. Can you have a turning point in August? Well, you, we'd just had a poor season and you do want to turn that around because you've not just been disappointing for a few weeks. It's been a, a year's worth of frustration. And you see, this is this is the thing also with Mark Haightley. Even when he scores the only goal of the game, albeit from the penalty spot, there's there's no credit to him whatsoever for actually scoring the penalty. Well, he, did, he did win the penalty himself. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, and was it a penalty? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Right, okay. um, a cross had come in from... The left, I think, and he flicked it over the defender and then just tried to barrel his way past him. Um, and the defender brought him down, so yeah, it was a penalty. And this is the point after these first three or four games and, and after a couple of defeats in a row where David Lloyd had this pop at um, the higher paid players at the club. Who specifically was he referring to? I think it was clear he was just referring to Mark Haightley. I think he just realised he, he needed Mark Haightley out of the club, but not for footballing matters. I don't think he had a clue um, whether Mark Haightley was doing any good on the pitch. I just think he was incensed. Um, and, he, and he brought in like Michael Appleton as his like, number one, somebody who'd been with him at his leisure clubs. Um, and I think he gave him twice the amount of money that Haightley was on to get Haightley off his contract. So I, I, don't, I, don't really, uh, I don't really think of that one. I think the lad used to say that he used to take the penalties because he was on a goal bonus. Yeah, <laughs> I think that, that doesn't, that doesn't well, sound surprising that, at all. That used to come in the, the last five why. minutes for yeah. an appearance bonus as well. Yeah, you see, so it, all, all that money. Mm. You see, we think that, that, that a lot of stories that you hear like that, whether it's to do with your club or not, you, yeah. you put down to cynicism. But I mean, it's a bit like this thing about deliberately getting booked at Christmas so you can have Christmas <laughs> off. And it really, I mean, I'm pretty certain Dino's done that at least once in his career, for example. Um, but these things really do happen, don't they? Where, where player managers bring themselves on with five minutes to go because they get a few quid appearance bonus and they insist on taking the penalties um, because they know they're going to get a goal bonus. I'm sure that goal bonuses in contracts shouldn't include penalties. <laughs> Just going back to Lloyd for a second, um, the, the big thing that had turned him against fans, when he first came to the club um, in the summer of 97, he was talking about building a super stadium. Um, and then suddenly that quickly became, 
why don't we renovate Boulevard and move Hull City to there? And, and you know, that I think as soon as he started mentioning, you know, moving to a rugby stadium, that was just, yeah. uh, uh, you know, no, uh, he had dog racing there. It wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't a place. Um, At the world for, famous Thruppany Stand. For technical sport. Um, <laughs> and at that point, you think things aren't going to happen under this man, are we? We, we sort of maybe need to get him out. Sharing a ground with the Hurlybirds. Um, so, at the end of that month, City were 21st uh, in um, what was called, by the way, League Division 3. Um, it, we hadn't got to League 1 and League 2 in the, at the bottom end of uh, English football at that stage. So, we go into... Oh, they beat Sto- uh, the progressing the League Cup after beating Stockport on away goals over two legs in August. And we go into September, four defeats in five... The one win was over Rochdale, thanks to goals from Richard Peacock and David Brown. David Brown, I've always said this about David Brown, I think he's a massively unsung hero, as far as Hull City's concerned. I don't think he was an amazing player, but in a poor team, which City were a lot of the time he was at the club, although an improving team in this season, uh, once Warren Joyce came in, he still was relatively reliable in front of goal, wasn't he, Justin? I mean, what what, what was he like? Did you feel like there was always a chance... While David Brown was in the side because he could put the ball in the net at this level. It was a great finish, yeah. You know, he's his work rate, you know, there's a lot to be desired, but he gave the ball and he had a chance. Are you he suggesting he's an <laughs> archetypal lazy centre forward? The, inter- <laughs> the interesting thing about that is his work improved under Joyce than it had under Hayley, mm-hmm. so you can imagine how shuffling he was in the uh, first part of the season. But getting David Brown was off the mark and, and City had another win, but I suppose the most, we were going away from. We're talking about a great escape season, but obviously there were cup ties. We progressed in the League Cup against Stockport, which meant we were playing Bolton, Andy. And um, this is the point where the, the protest against David Lloyd could really, um, really come to the fore and get national attention. It's still the greatest thing that Amber Nectar and Hull City supporters have ever been involved with. Yeah, I think we'll always have a childlike pride at uh, organising the the tennis ball protest at uh, at Bolton, but it did just illustrate just the fact that I think we, we, there wasn't frustration on the field that we were. We were experiencing. We were also disillusioned with how things were going off the field as well, and it felt as though the malaise was not just a, a bad season. It was the club was rotting slowly, and we've been there before, and we've been there, we've been there since. But the fact that we felt it necessary to take eight hundred tennis balls into a league cup tie and chuck them on the pitch and get them in, get them, get them, get them in without the without being feat. found. It yeah. was a logistic thing. Well, they just handed out on a Simon Gray coach. Yeah, and outside as well. Incredible. I mean, we, I mean, I wasn't there. Were you searched? I mean, were you yeah. searched anyway? Because yeah, you were under 18 at the time, so presumably um, it was difficult to search a minor, even though you've always liked some, looked like somebody in their early 40s. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, were you, were you searched personally? Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> right, OK. You just, had, dog just had no balls. You just <laughs> had no balls. They hadn't dropped yet. <laughs> they hadn't dropped. <laughs> it, I mean, it got City on, on in the national press, of course, although, um, and, and that picture of Steve Wilson with his arms... Out wide, as it were, surrounded by <laughs> tennis balls, is a brilliant photograph of, of a you know, of a brand's own boy looking uh, sort of typically um, <laughs> bewildered by what was going on what around. What was really him. ridiculous about that is we told Radio Homeside what was going to happen, and clearly they'd forgotten because Will and Roy said, "Are they throwing apples at Steve Wilson?" <laughs> no, thinking that it was something to do with the oranges that used to get chucked at Ian McKechnie. Apples aren't luminous and they don't bounce that high, <laughs> mm. but it was certainly effective because he put the club up for sale the very next day, yeah, and did, that he? was what was intended. It was to sort of humiliate him on a national scale Brilliant. in the same way that he was humiliating us because, you know, we mentioned about things were rotten financially, but they were rotten financially so Hull Sharks could buy a new prop. Um, <laughs> and that, that was the thing that was like, this, this isn't on, we're, we're being run down for the benefit of the rugby club. Did you ever meet David Lloyd? No, I never did. I can't remember ever meeting him, no. That's ex- extremely diplomatic. I'd like to think you met him <laughs> once and punched him in the face and just left again. Uh, but evidently not. City lost that cup tie against Bolton, um, 6-3 on aggregate. So ended there September 23rd and out of the League Cup. Into October, there was a Friday night game at Car- uh, against Cardiff, which was dubbed the last game. And the uh, the attendance, as a result, and they rocketed to 8,599 people. And, and all the regulars are looking around going, well, where the bloody hell have you lot come from? They just It was like going to watch a public hanging, wasn't it? Yeah, true. I do remember taking great pride in that attendance because it was the first stirrings of um, a suggestion that the people of Hull did actually care if the football club went under. We'd previously bobbled around with crowds in the like, four or five thousand, which is still very good for that level at the time, certainly. But to, to, to draw in nearly eight and a half thousand um, for a Friday night match against a team that didn't bring very many, being Cardiff on a, on a on a night, it just I think it was an illustration that 
Hull City did still matter in the city of Hull, even though things had been not great for, for a lot of years. That that night, I still remember that with a, with a good deal of pride that the, the people of Hull rallied round. David Brown scores City's goal in a in a, a, a 2-1 defeat. Um, but obviously it wasn't the last game. I mean, did you go there, Les, genuinely thinking it might be, though? Or, or was there always this idea that, you know, something will happen after the final whistle and City will still be playing the following week? Well, the reason it had been dubbed potentially the last game is because uh, David Brown had said if he didn't get an owner, you know, fairly soon... David Lloyd. White. Sorry, yeah, do. Yeah, David Lloyd said if he, if he didn't get new owners soon, he was going to wind the club up. Whether that was just him being petulant, I, I don't know. I don't really don't really see what he would have um, had to have, had to have gained from that. But Amber Nectar had already met somebody who said I wanted to buy the club in the in the, the summer previously. It was it was Tom Belton, the former Scunthorpe United chairman. We met him of all places in the Tropical Nights um, nightclub. Well, you did, and he did it because he was underage. <laughs> yeah, because he was underage. <laughs> <Yeah, well, laughs> <I'm not mind. laughs> But yeah, yeah, we met, we met him in there with Matt Barlow from the Hull Daily Mail, and it's quite bizarre talking about the potential of a football club to, you know, rhythm as a dancer playing in the background, <laughs> um, which was a, a little bit. Are you going to check whether I got the year right? Yeah. I don't, I don't rhythm as a dancer was '93, I think. But not that it, not, but it could still have been playing. It didn't have to be. A, it didn't have to be something from that year, did it? No, no, no. Okay, rhythm of the night, whatever. Corona. Um, <laughs> so we knew there were people who were interested, and also Don Robinson had lodged an interest, and he'd got to the point where he was doing due diligence um, so there were some people who knew that there were stirrings going on that there were people interested in the club um, but there was, there was a you know possibility he was that kind of petulant man yeah. that you never knew whether he would just say oh yeah we'll close the club you know just for that he was he was he was very very quick to you know, he, a bit babyish really in his response how he how he made his money I don't know presumably he left people who knew what they were doing in charge um, but, he, but he was a very very volatile uh, volatile individual. Um, but what I remember that I don't remember at that game thinking, oh, where have all these people been? It, it felt like a bit of a Hull City love fest. Um, you know, people were genuinely showing an outpouring of emotion. The Hull Daily Mail came out with loads of placards and were people all them up. There was, there was a real, you know, it was a really good advert from the fans to say, if anybody's interested in the club, this is a club worth saving. And this is a club where, you know, if you show it a bit of love, people will come and watch us. City won at Scarborough with goals from Neil Mann and the only outfield goal in the whole City career of uh, one Mr Mark Hakeley. Yeah, he hit it straight to the keeper, didn't he? And the keeper accommodatingly got out of the way. So, I <laughs> so you're still the... not giving him any credit? <laughs> no, 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 it's been what, 20 years. <laughs> what, what was hilarious about that was there was this guy who had decided that because me and you were fanzine editors, we were some kind of power brokers, and he kept jabbing his finger at us telling about what we had to do something to get rid of Mark Haley because he didn't know what he was doing. And as soon as Mark Haley scored, he was the first to run on the pitch and hug him. <laughs> but It's like the game where you stood in the rain while everybody else went undercover because you... you, you you felt you had, because you, well, we know that anyway, but but you felt you had to set an example of some description because you were fanzine editors. I don't think it's because we were fanzine editors. I think it was just young and stupid, and we'd had a few many a few many drinks. We thought we were being big and clever, and we'd certainly make the Tiger Chat match report of our you know rain drenched heroics, but we didn't. Which got wet. Yeah. So weird. City ended um, the month at the bottom of the whole league. This was the first month where City went ninety second, twenty fourth in the table. Uh, three points adrift in uh, in what was very much last place. And we get into November, and this was the month when Justin arrived. City lost two home games in four days without scoring. Um, after the second against Brighton, the contract of Mark Hakeley was terminated. Now, Warren Joyce took over, and the chap sitting to my left here was his first signing. Just before we move on to Warren Joyce's appointment in an isolated way, just the reaction to Mark Hakeley's sacking. It had to happen, didn't it? Because Things were getting worse. And That's almost being stuff. diplomatic, Andy. I mean, surely you were running around the streets in your semi <laughs> shouting at the top of your semi-broken voice. There was still the fact that he wasn't the only problem at the club. There was, right. There was still the other. And that but... people weren't agitating against Mark Hartley. I think they understood that perhaps he didn't understand the division and the players he would bring in you know, weren't quite going to be the right fit for the division. But I think, if anything, the, the, I think some people respected Hartley's dignity um, the fact that he never rose to Lloyd baiting him. You know, Lloyd was constantly criticising him and chirping about, about the size of his wages. Well, he didn't negotiate his contract. Um, you know, Mark Haley didn't know what he was doing as a manager. Um, was he a hateful figure? No, no, not at any but, point. But that doesn't, that, that doesn't stop some extremely um, well-adjusted, intelligent Hull City fans of our acquaintance absolutely loathing Mark Haley. 
I don't remember that happening. In fact, a lot of people was, was slightly still starstruck by the name. I mean, this is a guy that had played for England, played for AC Milan. I always remember uh, one of the Hawkridge brothers was always going, you can't sack him, you don't run a jug on water. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was trying to imply that Haitley hadn't been given the tools to do the job. And I'll, I'll be quite frank, that was correct. He was told there'll be money to spend on players and then he brought in nothing but free transfers because he didn't have the choice. So he wasn't given the tools to do the job. I don't know whether he'd have done the job even if he'd have had the tools, um, but I don't think Haley. I was glad to see him go, but I don't mm. think Haley was the villain of the piece. Warren Joyce took over. Now, before Warren Joyce did anything uh, as manager, just the news that Warren Joyce took over, Les, what was your reaction then? Was it a case of, well, we haven't really got much choice and he's the senior player? Um, it wasn't met with massive enthusiasm. He'd had, his, he'd had his difficulties but with the one, captain. He had, but Warren Joyce had rebuilt his reputation yeah, since yeah. that. So yeah, there was the um, there was there was the one where you know he, he, the, the, the play the, the players were getting a lot of stick from the from the fans. Um, Kempton was empty because it was uh, you know dilapidated, and he celebrated a goal by running to the Kempton and and you know milking the non applause of an empty stand. And he it, and made it, a really good point in doing that when you look back. Point. It was justified, but you know it irked a lot of people. But having said that, he was probably the player of the year the previous year um, so I think any any ill will against him had sort of gone by that point he just wasn't an inspiring appointment you know people <laughs> this, this seems quite funny given his, his, his recent comments but people were saying we should bring Neil Warnock in you know mm -hmm. because he was somebody who was impressing mm -hmm. in the lower leagues at that. Or they, or they were looking at lower league managers and because new owners had come in and they said there was going to be an infusion of cash and an infusion of new ideas I don't think anybody immediately thought they're going to promote from within, so it felt with the people thinking, is this a bit of a Hobson's choice? Um, there's also, whenever on. you appoint a player manager from within, um, Andy, um, there's also a worry that he's going to be a bit too close to the players and not going to be able to isolate himself, but he proved straight away that he was his own man because he dropped Gregor Rioch and never picked him again to start a match. And Gregor awesome. Rioch had been an ever-present up to that point. He also dropped um, one of the summer signings in Neil Whitworth. I mean, he made two... I mean, it wasn't in a huge squad and he was going to bring players in, as we're about to find out when we talk to this chap on my left who was about to join the club. Mm. But the, the very first... Uh, he, he, City lost 3-2 to Scunthorpe and there was no sign of Whitworth and there was no sign of, of Rioch. You know, these changes had immediately been made. Well, Joe spoke quite, um, quite thoughtfully at the time, didn't he, about the need to have a new job. The fact that things have got to change in terms of how he approached it and obviously just knew the best about how he managed to do that. And if, if he, in the dressing room, said, I'm not one of the lads anymore, I'm a gaffer, I don't know quite how that all works within the confines of a, of a dressing room. But I always thought he just seemed to do it quite well. He seemed to get it very quickly that he wasn't one of the lads anymore. He also lost Neil Mann around this time to long-term injury. Um, so there's this 3-2 defeat to Scunthorpe, and then the first acquisition of the Warren Joyce era of course, arrived. Of the Scunthorpe game was where he collided with the post and did his crucial yeah. ligament, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I remember after that game thinking that's it. We're fucked. Um, you know, we were six points adrift at the bottom of the division, and you just thought, how, how is it even possible? We, I remember at the point where we we contacted a Halifax fan and said, "Will you do us an article about what life in the conference was like?" And so we was running articles in the fanzine saying, "You know, oh well, when you play in the conference, you play four, forty different cup competitions: like <laughs> Maluka, Sausage and Onion, Sachet McShield, and all all of this stuff." Anyway, so. But that was so fear. Somebody tell who who told you the news that Hull City were in for you. Who was the individual? Was it your manager? Did you have an agent at the time? Was it your wife no, took the phone call? The, the manager Brian Little. Right. Phoned me and said that obviously Hull City have been been on the phone, they're interested. I gave them permission to speak to you. I went, oh, okay then, that's fine. So, it, so someone will be ringing you at some point, and John McGovern. Oh, right. Yeah, John McGovern. Who'd only just arrived as Warren yeah. Joyce's assistant, yeah. So John McGovern phoned, phoned me, spoke to me. Did Warren Joyce and John McGovern, did you have any previous connection with either of them? No. Or was it just a case of them knowing their, their football players? No, I think Warren Joyce was big friends with Lou McCarry. Right. And Lou McCarry signed me. Celtic. From Celtic. And then yeah. took me to Stoke. So he obviously he knew all about me. So obviously, I think Warren's dad was associated with Manchester United. Obviously, Lou McCarry was associated with, so that's how I think it came about. Did you look at the league table when you found out who was interested yet and then think, what the hell would I want to go there for? <laughs> I did look, and then I thought, I'm half far away, I'd have to travel. <laughs> and, but it's, 
it was a bit different for me because I was just wanting to play football. Mm. You know, I, you know, I always like a challenge no matter what club I'm at. It could be any club. I still want to play and give 100%. That, that's me. It doesn't matter if we're at the top or at the bottom. Just wanted to go there and and play. Mm. And obviously, you were 27 at the time, and at that age, you needed to be playing football regularly, didn't you? Yeah, you know, I had a lot of time. You know, I didn't want to leave Stoke. I'd been there. Good that's, few years. That's not yeah. very it's, often. Yeah, I was thinking. Phrase, I was it? thinking the same thing. You know, whether you're talking about the football club or the city <laughs> as a whole. You know, I didn't want to leave Stoke. Isn't something people say often. Sorry, that was no. very rude of us <laughs> yeah, um, to interrupt. But was it was, it was it a quick decision to make in the end, though? Or did you have to think about I had it? To think about it definitely. You know, I had four good years at, at Stoke and I got play of the year season before at Stoke. So. Why on earth did they want you to go then? I don't know. It's well, not want you to go. That's a bit harsh. Why did they give permission? Want to go. Yeah. You weren't really player of the year, were you? Yeah, he's just said that. Mm-hmm. And then, and then there's the manager Brian Little, who of course would be very grateful for you in his later career, uh, saying that you can go and join a club that's literally the worst in the country. You know, because obviously Brian Little had just just taken over, and he wanted to bring in some mm. some of these younger players that he had at Aston Villa. So obviously, do like people play that obviously came to us Ben Petty. You know, players like. That. He brought to Stoke after to replace me after I'd left. Mm. Decided to go, but it was it was a, a massive decision. You know, I sat, sat my wife. And obviously, yeah, it was a when I saw any points, we had a thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But then, obviously, we signed another player on the same same time, Gareth, Gareth Williams. Williams. Yeah, and he lived in Derby as well. Did you, you car share? Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. Car shared until you st- got a chance to look around all the nice houses in Walkington and wonder whether you could afford any of them. And, mm. and yeah, I couldn't afford any of Walkington. Up. It yeah, right. so, <laughs> so it was a, you know, it was a massive decision. And you then, both played in an important 1 0 win over Carlisle, Carlisle which was your was debut. First game, and it yeah. was a, it's, I mean, it's famous for being your debut, but also it was, it was a very famous kind of victory, wasn't it, Andy? The Carlisle game. It was kind of 1 0 that we needed at the time because I think. Um, we were in danger of getting really cut off at the time, and to 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 burgle a win like that, Carlisle were a mean team at the time. But it, it, it felt like things were bad. Things were really bad still. But could we turn it around? There was a way out of it. It felt like it, and and the nature of the victory, Les, the late victory, and the fact that it was another newbie or relatively new player to us who'd scored mm. uh, the goal, and it meant a lot to Craig Dudley, didn't it, to get that goal? He talked about it a lot afterwards, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. Um... Uh, coming coming after the, the the run of defeats, yeah, it was just a little bit of a bit of a sliver of hope. Although we had the one thing that was fun around that time was um, playing in the cup. You know, in in each cup competition, we knocked out a team from the higher round. We knocked mm. out Sto- uh, Stockport. Um, we knocked out Luton um, in the FA Cup. That, that was that, that, that was, was that's up. to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then. But before that, you had the jolly up at Salisbury. Mm, yeah, that was ace. That was brilliant, Salisbury. Away, Were you yeah. involved that day? I don't think. I don't, no, I can't remember. I don't think because you, you wouldn't have been cup tied, would you? So I mean, this was the first round anyway, so you couldn't possibly have been cup tied. But there was a jolly up at the FA in the FA Cup at I think Salisbury. It was like and three days after you joined. Yeah, I can't remember. I, yeah, I, I can't remember. And that was Warren Joyce's. That, that was Warren Joyce's first game in charge. So yeah. probably not then. Just in that before case. me, then yeah. Yeah, just before. But that, that 1 0 win over Carlisle, I mean, what do you remember of your debut? That's Boothbury Park. I don't know if you'd ever played there for Stoke or anybody else before, but that was Boothbury Park, your first experience of your new home and seeing what the club was about, what the fans were about, and what the, uh, what the fans were going through, and also getting a chance to assess your new teammates. What, what were your, and be honest with us, what were your first impressions? I don't know, because obviously I, I went with my wife and was, was, was going, we went through Gypsyville. And all I remember is these massive trees either side of the road. And it looked like a haunted graveyard. Because we were going down, <laughs> thought the pinnacle size of these trees. You couldn't even see the stadium because of these trees on either side past the, is it Francis Askew School? Yep. On either yeah. side of the road, road, these yeah. ma- on North Road, you had these massive trees. It was all entwined. I thought, oh, this looks a bit scary. <laughs> it's a bit scary, <laughs> Danny. And I went, I went into the wrong entrance first. I went into the first turning where all the hot dogs and salt that would have been <laughs> the big stand. Yeah. And I pulled in there. Uh, excuse me, can you tell me where the changing rooms? Oh, you've come in the wrong one, love. Next one. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, okay, love. thank that you. That wasn't Martin <laughs> Painstock then. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but, you know, it was... I just remember, all I remember was, can we get a win? I just didn't want to lose. I didn't want to concede. It. Well, I remember it being a tough game and Craig Dudley scoring from a corner near the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to, to win one 0 but it was it was a nice experience. And, and you trained with the players before this, or was you but literally your I was first late involvement? On the, right, because no, I signed on the on the Friday, and the agent my agent was driving, and we went all over the place to get here. 
and got here late, so the lads didn't start tra- we didn't stop we know about half an hour training because I didn't get here till gone half eleven, twelve o'clock. Yeah. And usually the lads would be finished by then. Mm. So I only trained on that back little pitch. When I got here, I thought, God, I reckon what's their training ground? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> like well, yeah. side. Yeah, in a couple yeah. of years, in a couple of years' time, you'd be training on traffic <laughs> islands. So it'd be, uh, uh, it was probably the, the height of luxury at, at the time. So November, then we've reached the end of November, and uh, City were still twenty fourth and last, and still three points adrift. Although that victory against Carlisle would would come to be representative of, of of at least part of City's eventual recovery although it was still a while in coming we get to December and it was four league defeats out of four so even though changes were being made and there was an element of positivity around the club certainly by comparison to what had gone before um, ultimately it wasn't um, being reflected by results on the pitch but more players were coming in now you could you'd started to settle presumably by this point you could welcome in Andy Oakes and three new defenders to play with you. And you already had Mike Edwards and Mark Greaves who clearly were going to have a big say uh, in, in City's future over the rest of the season and, and beyond. But now you could um, also involve Jason Perry, Steve Swales and one John Whitney. And um, Whitney scored an own goal on his league debut <laughs> at Chester. That proved the difference on Boxing Day in a 2-1 defeat. What do you remember of that? What do you remember of, of meeting John Whitney? Because he was your equal in terms yeah, of, of yeah. the sort of the stature of the of the 100% defender, wasn't he? Yeah, definitely. He was he was strong. He didn't mess about. You know, in fact, he was probably worse than me. I mean, if, if he was going to take you out, he took you out. <laughs> right. What do you mean? For, for a meal? <laughs> for, for, for a drink? For the, the, pic- meal, not to the a pictures? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> meal, did the meal consist of worms at all? <laughs> After he snapped you in two, not a problem. <laughs> Fair enough. And then Andy Oak was a big upcoming defender. I thought we got him from non league from a non league team. He was a goalkeeper. Yeah. And yeah. so he made he mm. made Winsford, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that, that was it. Which yeah. oddly enough, John Whitney had played for in his early career. He played for Winsford as well, although he'd, he'd gone to Huddersfield and then Lincoln after that. Who was it who told us that John Whitney had a load of worms from the pitch before kick off? Was, was it Matt Greaves? He's crazy, yeah. John Whitney was that yeah, stupid. He yeah. would <laughs> You're one of the there. few people who could say that about John Whitney and not get his face filled in, probably. He was that stupid. Some of the daft things, even Jason, Jason Perry, they used to like, oh, when they were, when was they, they was injured, they used to go, Mick Matthews should take us on a bike ride around Beverly. <laughs> them, them two used to play like, just go, right, I dare you, I dare you, I dare you. To go down this hill, we'll just go straight across the road, no matter what, no matter what was coming. <laughs> Well, that had gone down well with the insurance and company, them too. wouldn't it? Who would do it? Them too. <laughs> and if John Whitney gets hit by a lorry, you can imagine the lorry mm. coming off worse, can't them you? Them two are crazy. But, yeah, but ultimately, these new players were arriving, but it was still four league defeats out of four. Yeah, I mean, it, was so a, it, it, it was a slow start for you as a City player. I mean, you, you don't get disheartened, but eventually right. you get to a point where you wonder, at what point are we going to run out of time? Yeah, definitely, because after the, the games are coming, and if you stop picking up points, you, you, you gradually the team above you gets further away, further away and further away. So sooner or later we had to start picking up points to try and catch the teams teams above us. Mm. And obviously as we start to bring in more players we gradually got that deficit. Mm. So a lot smaller obviously with Gary Bradden coming in. Well. Which was the following month, yeah. There was Football League trophy progress at Notts County and that win at Luton in the FA Cup. That um that also windscreen shield game against Notts County was Jermaine Pennant's debut. And they didn't actually say his first name, the scoreboard just said Penance, and, and that was it. Um, but yeah, we beat. Was he them. electronically tagged? <laughs> Possibly, but the uh, the Luton game in the cup was a, was a lot of fun. Um, unexpected, but I, I think you know as we were losing losing games in the league, it was something like that that gave you a little bit of heart that we could go to us even a higher division um, and beat them in the cup. And it was uh, big Bob Dewhurst with a um, with, a, with a, a header after a, after a long ball. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know what it was like as a player. You know whether you thought the the cup was a, a distraction or not. But fr- from a fan's point of view, it felt like a welcome distraction to what was happening in the league. The, the little mm. cup run we went on. Ben Morley scored that day. Yeah, I've always I've always enjoyed the fact that, pe- game, that, yeah. that people call him Ken Morley <laughs> after the actor from Coronation Street. But yeah, that was Ben Morley's first game Ten for City. Forward, yeah, good, fast, very quick player. It was his first game. He played absolutely well that game. So I think we went 1-0 up, mm. one all, and then, yeah, obviously Bob Oates scored the winner to make it 2-1. But... What do you make of Bob Dewhurst? Because you'd come in essentially to replace him. Well, he was left-sided, I was right-sided, I played Bob a few times. And That's where the, the, the chant comes from that we sing now, left side and right side. It was started by Justin Whittle and Bob Dewhurst, you <laughs> He said. was left side and I was, I was yeah. on the right side because he was, he was a left foot. And I, I like playing with Bob who's Big, strong defender. He'd been with the club a good yeah. four or five years at this stage. You know, he, d- he didn't have the have the pace, but that wasn't a problem because I 
I did then, so I could cover mm. for <laughs> them, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we did complement each other quite well, but then he obviously got one or two injuries, and obviously we had Jason Perry, Mark Greaves, that all could, could play in that, that same position. So we had it, and obviously Neil Whitworth was out injured, so, just, you know, he was long term, so we didn't know when he was going to come back into the fold. But it, we started to, you know, have enough mm. depth definitely at centre half. You got any memories of those league games then, Les? Because I'm not mentioned any by. Um, by name, apart from the Chester game against Boxing Day, there was also a defeat to Torquay and Swansea and Shrewsbury during the, that month. It was the Shrewsbury one that was the hardest to take because we'd actually played quite well in yeah. that game. Um, 3 2 away from home. And yeah, it just felt like all of that playing really well. Uh, yeah. It was my, well, yeah, because I'm doing this and I remember that game because I thought I was a bit of a player then and I remember the ball. Which was in the first half. I remember the ball coming over and I went to chest it down. I chested it straight to the centre forward and smashed it in. <laughs> I just always remember that game. Never at this did point, what, I, did <laughs> I never did that again. <laughs> at this point, Andy I did it. <laughs> at this point, Andy and Les are thinking, "What? Who have we signed? <laughs> maybe, maybe we're not. Maybe we're not convinced by this new boy after no, all." No, I was just glad that you said it rather than. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I, remember, I remember I gave him a goal. I tested it straight to him. Listen, the, I got this guy on KCFM years ago, and I did ask him in front of other City fans in the in the studio, "Was Mark Joseph really better than you?" And it, 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 you smiled at me, but. Uh, <laughs> But, but it was a, it was an, a, an assassin's smile. I managed to escape. <laughs> so we get to the end of the calendar year, around the end of '98, twenty fourth and last, and six points adrift. Had you given up? Yeah, I honestly had actually. Um, because was this seventeen year old naivety, or was was there was the method behind your um, madness? Do you well, think? Well, I think the method was we were six points off, weren't we? And we just lost four. I think it was the Shrewsbury one that really made me think that because we'd actually, had, we, like you said, like, we'd played all right that day, and it still didn't happen. And six points off. No, I think I think I'd give up. Had you given up? Yeah, well, I'd given up in the November. So I was on antidepressants. <laughs> well. So we get to the new year, 1999, and we begin Les with the thriller at the oh, villa. Yeah, the thriller um, at the villa. Yeah. <laughs> can, can the periscopies actually see that? Because yeah, yeah. I can't see on our well, screen in front of us. You. So yes, the thriller at the villa. Les has donned. For those of you just doing the audio version of this podcast, Les has donned the cap. Um, that has got the whole Daily Mail's um, logo on it, and did everybody wear those at Villa Park? No, just the twats. Um, <laughs> so who did you get that from? <laughs> Do you know the funny thing is, I was slagging people off for wearing these hats on the day. Look at all these people. It's like people who've never been, been gone to a game before, and they're, they're having to wear an identification to show that they're the, the, the new people. And the irony is, I end up buying one on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think you'd added a few gins. And, oh yeah, yeah. Like, oh, that'll be funny. I love that. Well, but yeah, awful things. The current it? incarnation of Hull City goes to Aston Villa this week. Weekend, but back in 1999, the circumstances were were rather. I mean, we're above them in the table at the moment. But this was first versus 92nd. It wasn't just us at the bottom, yeah. but they. I think they had John Gregory as manager at the time, didn't they? They were top of the the whole thing, and they were an impressive side. Oh, yeah. do you know what I'd completely forgotten about? Um, is that when the whole Daily Mail did an article about the players' cars? Um, and and like Sam Sharma had like the worst car, but I think it's about. I was really well this dressed. Isn't you. Yeah. <laughs> well, John Whitney, yeah. by the sound of it, was only riding a bike. <laughs> um, City lost three nil. It, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't the worst performance of the season, right. though, was it? It was just against a very good side, and three uh, nil is obviously conclusive and comprehensive. Um, and you would presumably have to deal with Stan Collymore on the day. Yeah, I remember the first goal. I thought I had it, Lee Hendry. I thought, yeah, I've got him. He just was about to get there, he flicks it right just over my head to stand mm. Colin Moore to slot away the first goal. And, that, and then that put us on the. It was, it was, we enjoyed it. You go, you, Marsh, yeah. But it was you, a hot. You go, Heggie Oak was playing. Yeah. And I think Gareth, Gareth Southgate played as well. And Joe Chim scored the other one. Yeah, I remember Joe Chim Yeah, scored. I mean, they were a good side, that Villa team. They didn't, they didn't hold on to it for the yeah, rest of that season. Yeah, because we had Craig Falconbridge on loan. Mm. He, played, mm. he played up front. So it was just. It was just it was Did that not worry you that he might not be any good, given that his parent club had given him permission to play for City in the oh, FA yeah, Cup? No. Well, maybe his parent club hadn't made it, it to the just third a, round. He did all right. He did okay, Pop yeah. Actually, just his name was too long. I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 it did. That's, that's um, only one thing I remember that day was. I remember like when, when, when they scored the first goal. Thing. I mean, the whole end all standing above one is an impressive and beautiful sight, but I don't want to see it again. And then I've got, we've got to see it another, another two times. What well, was that a welcome distraction for the players, or was it a, an, an annoyance? No, or? it was a welcome distraction. Right. Definitely, okay. yeah, definitely. Because it was all everyone wants to play against the best team, mm -hmm. the best players, and it was just a chance, you know, if we go there, do well. Okay, no one's expecting us to do well. We go there, and we 
give a good good account of ourselves. Yeah, and do you think that giving a good account of yourself was you able to take anything from? Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Put, it wasn't a negative defeat, if you know what I mean. Okay, we lost three 0 but it didn't. It didn't distract us. That it gave us a lift, if anything. It certainly did. If you look at the form, because although City went out the FA Cup to Villa three 0 in that third round tie. Um, it was an unbeaten month in the league, and it started. It, well, Gary Brabin arrived after that cup tie, and Mark Bonner, Andy, Mark also Bonner arrived. First. And he arrived, he played, he scored, and then he left again. I mean, it, 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 in terms of short but effective Hull City careers, he's at the top of, of the all-time list, isn't he? Yeah, he really was. What a what a what a cameo! I can't remember anything about his performance either. Just his very very fortuitous goal. Didn't it leave Pollard in goal first? Yeah, it was Mike died over it. Mike Pollard. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. this was against Rotherham, wasn't it? Rotherham. Yeah, they were. So, so that was just um, sorry. That's you. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was Gary Bradbury's debut, wasn't it? And yeah. like you know, within the first couple of minutes, he clattered you know some <laughs> some Rotherham player. In. Did Brabs completely take over when he walked when he walked through the door? No, no, certainly not. He was. Typical scouts took him five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you, you, we've got. Some, I mean, the 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 big personalities in the club. You're there. Whitney's there. Brabin's there. You're led by a big personality manager who'd been the previous big fish as a player in the changing room. And you know, there were one or two players who uh, Warren Joyce had inherited and played with before who weren't shrinking violets. The personality of the squad had changed completely, hadn't it? Yeah, definitely. To be fair, he got the right personalities in. There was not a clash between any of the big personalities. So you all got on as well. Yeah. There was no yeah. egos going yeah. on. We wouldn't allow it, and there was, we weren't in a position where you could have mm. players of that type in. Because it wouldn't have worked. You'd have to have the right players, and he managed to get the right blend of players and the right egos. We, we seem to go from having no leaders to having five or six captains. And I remember just in... Uh, oh, why? I remember Warren Joyce, um, when he was interviewed by Matt Barlow um, before the FA Cup final, he was looking back at the Great Escape season and uh, he said, I signed all of the players I hated playing against. <laughs> Um, and I thought that was a really, you know, because he, wa- he wanted to to make it uncomfortable for for other teams. Un- under Hayley, t- teams had a, a, an easy ride against us. Under Warren Joyce, they didn't. They, they was really in a game. So what um, struck me looking back because when you when you look back at the players we signed, because we signed about eight players in a short period, and and you know when like something happens in football and you you can never remember before it, like you can never remember before the pass back rule. And and, <laughs> and I was thinking in terms of the, the transfer window, and I was looking back at the dates we signed all the players, and it was only Brabin signed after the after January. Everyone and bef- else and, and there was nobody signed in August. Yeah, everybody else came in um, in, in November, November December in December, and you think, yeah. wow, you can do that now. The, the transfer window yeah. wouldn't allow you to do. Well, no, that. I mean we used to have the old transfer deadline day. You could sign players whenever you liked. Up to I think the second week in March, yeah, yeah. Um, but and that, we that still have been existed. able to have made the wholesale changes as yeah. early as we did. Mm. And, and you know, I know that I know that we made a lot of wholesale changes, and then we lost four in a row. But clearly, that period of players playing together would have been beneficial. You know, if that had been put back till January, would would we have been too late? I don't, I don't know. It's there a, were other players. Who, there, were, there were other players who would still join after January. Colin Alside was on the way, for example. Um, just to make it clear about Mark Bonner, for those who don't know, he arrived on loan from Cardiff. He was a striker. He scored on his debut against Rotherham, got injured in training a few days later and went back to Rotherham. So he only played one game for City. Cardiff, Cardiff. Cardiff, sorry. Cardiff. Car- I beg your pardon. He only played one game for City, scored one goal, which happened to be the only goal of the game, that started a run of, of four unbeaten in a very important month. So I- even though it was only one 90-minute cameo, as Andy says... In terms of the context of how the season was going to pan out, his contribution was enormous. Yeah, without a doubt. Just that, that one goal. Three points. Mm. <laughs> Three points. OK, he, got, he was a good player. And unfortunately, he got, he got injured and, and that curtailed his, uh, his, time, his time with us. I think, he obviously, Gary Brabin knew him anyway. Mm. So he was good mates with, with Gary Brabin. So Which helps, doesn't it, if you know somebody that. already in, in the club. Um, it was, as I said, an unbeaten month in the league. There were two wins, two draws. Now, two big things happened during this, this period. Firstly, um, Richard Peacock left 
and he joined Lincoln City. Now, he he'd not had a great season, he'd been injured as well, but he was a very, very high-quality footballer for that level. Now, did, were either of you two surprised, disappointed, or what, what emotion did you feel of Richard Peacock leaving at this stage? I think surprised. Like you say, he'd not featured an awful lot. He was very good, I think, in the 95, 96, and the season after that, he was he was one of the better ones in Hitler's first season. But it just didn't... It stopped happening for him, hadn't it? And yeah. maybe that's the... The accumulation of a couple of injuries. He was the epitome of the sort of signing that Dolan was good at, wasn't I th- he? I think his going to Lincoln was part of the deal for um, Perry. Whitney and Perry coming. So I think at the time people were thinking, well, two for the, you know, two for one. That's that's no. not a bad deal. Um, so I, I think he, he's a player that you maybe you, you lament losing now, with Richard Peacock. But at the time, I think. I think it was wow, everything was going wrong. Yeah. I, I, I think it went well off the road. Without that, we'd never ever have had Whitney's goal at Peterborough. Which That's is true. the other thing I was going to mention. Now, it was an amazing, it was an amazing goal. What's the phrase again? A thunderbastard. Thunderbastard. <laughs> Not only that, but I can imagine that he wouldn't shut up about it afterwards. <laughs> I remember him getting. He was absolutely chucking it down the rain, pouring it down. I remember this was at Peterborough. Free, yeah, I remember him getting a free kick and just going. No one else thought it was from a good distance. Mm. And there's only Risa there's only one. There's only yeah. There's only one <laughs> one player that can hit it as, as hard as that with a sweet left foot, and that was John Whitney. And he flew like an arrow. We were Straight, right. and, and we managed to hold on, didn't we, until the last few yeah. seconds, didn't we? We thought, and, that, and when they scored, we thought, oh, and we couldn't believe. It. We was happy with draw, but we would have been over the moon with, with three points because yeah. we, we battled it. We set because and to win with that and to win with that goal. For, Right. No, we, uh, we we drew with that game. Yeah, but to, yeah, yeah, but we were we were we, we were yeah, winning yeah. with a minute to go when they equalised. So it was a good point though. Because no one expected this. Because I think they were near the top when we yeah, played them. They were a good team, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, they were. It was it was a tough battle, but it was. To get I, such I, I also loved us that first half Pagarin of Hartlepool. They, they oh, well. they <laughs> Peter Beardsley's Hartlepool. Peter Beardsley, yeah, <laughs> yeah. of all, of all of all teams. Yes. Yeah, I mean that that that's that's off again that bit. Peterborough were in the top ten at the time of that um, of that game in in January, so they, they were there they, they were there or thereabouts as the cliche goes. City finished January twenty fourth still, but now only a point behind Scarborough, and Scarborough was still to come to Boothbury Park in in March. So having given up at the turn of the year, suddenly one month in, and we're all presumably reasonably optimistic again. I think yeah, because we it won't, it won't, the results were obviously changing, but the performances and the field was now starting to to change. We would never ever have got anything at Peterborough, for example, earlier in the season. But we went to a good team who always seemed to have um, the Indian sign over us and played really, really well and came very close to winning. But we were, we were picking stuff, stuff up every week now. Two wins, two draws. Um, that, that We just weren't doing that and we'd clawed our way back in. And when you're only a point off and a place off, you, you start to think, mm, OK, yeah, yeah, I think thing, things are happening. It's not a lost cause anymore. And then we get to a... Arguably the key victory of the season, Brentford. Still one of my favourite away games of all time. Quoted recently by, um, I think, Steve Weatherill in one of the recent match reports after um, City's phenomenal run of success and and, um, the win at Leeds United over Christmas. Um, quoted amongst other amazing away days in terms of the importance, in terms of the domination, and and in terms of the sort of unexpectedness of it all, because Brentford were no slouches. They didn't do a top. On they, the they, they were. They, they won the league that year. Yeah, yeah they, they ended up winning the league. They were in the top three a, a lot of this period. Um, City didn't just win, but they won well. They won with a clean sheet, and they had a brand new striker to accommodate in Colin Elside, oh, just in, and he scored, he scored yeah. early on as well. It was, I remember the game because I had to mark Leo Fortune West, who sent a forward for them that day, and, was, and he's probably two or three inches taller than me, so it was a good aerial battle that day. <laughs> and to be fair, we, everyone played well that day, the, the whole team throughout. It was a, it was a red hot day. Because I remember Brabs, yeah. Brabs has got into trouble that he played a game before. And he'd, something had happened at the end of the game, and he went in their dressing room and dragged the player out, and, got <laughs> and he'd been banned for, for so many games, and and that play was still there that he'd done it to. But okay, it was it was okay with Rob this time. It was like he said his feet and everything, but but um, as you would with Gary, <laughs> yeah. But it was a, it was a fantastic. I think I remember a little flick on and Colin Offside was did. Was it Brown he scored yeah, as well? Brownie yeah, scored. he scored. That was a, that was a peach yeah. of a goal, was the and in front of the city fans as well. That's what I mean. But Brownie, he could always, he could always finish. And that's what, that's what he was there for. You know, I did, okay, we didn't mind. He didn't work as hard as everybody else. 
But it is, you put the ball in the net for us. Absolutely, and it is revered as one of the great City away performances of, of, of the last sort of couple of generations of Hull City. Um, because it was unexpected, because it was again such a good side for the division we were in. Um, albeit we were coming, we were coming into it on the back of four undefeated games. To do it with a clean sheet, to do it with a brand new striker, and most crucially of all, as City came off the bottom of the table as a result of that win. I thought he was going to say most crucially we did it in that beautiful all white. One that Andy yeah. is wearing it for our nice, periscopies. Yeah. Yes, you are right. We did come off the bottom of the league that day, and, uh, and that, that's that's psychologically an enormous moment, whether you're player, manager, or supporter, isn't it? Yeah, I was a very um, well-oiled supporter <laughs> after that one. Yeah, we, we just we drank a lot after that game. But we came back down to earth, didn't we, Andy? Because we got an absolute hiding on telly the following Friday against Rochdale, didn't we? Yeah, we we, we really did Rochdale. Oh my goodness, it was just an awful night. One City fans embarrassed themselves on the telly. It was one of those grim, grim evenings that belonged to more the October of that season. But we were still, we were still so much better, weren't we? That 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 felt like a one-off in a way that it wouldn't have done earlier on. Well, it certainly turned into a one-off when you look at uh, the remainder of um, of the season. I remember watching that game um, against Rochdale. I was in a pub in Patrington, and I left with about fifteen minutes to go. And you don't leave football matches early, but I think you're allowed to if you're watching them in the pub mm. and your team's getting a bit of a shoeing because it was embarrassing. It, it was, it was. I can't where did it come from? Uh, that'll be it then. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. If I was in the dugout. If I was injured, but. For some reason, I just do not. I remember being on Sky. Yeah, I just don't remember playing. Yeah. Was that our first game on Sky? Because we'd been we'd been on we'd been on BS League game. On yeah, we'd been on BSB game. in the early nineties with the Zenith, Zenith Data, Data yeah. but I can't remember us being live on television after that until this game against it's Rochdale. Like one thing I always remember as well is there was a a Rochdale flag that said something like. Rochdale Premier League champions 2003 2004, which was like the minimum you know, amount of seasons it would have taken. Yeah, okay then. Yeah, but well, they were only, it was, it was they were only sort of lower mid table during yeah. this period as well. But after that, 1 0 win, one wins at Darlington and Halifax, 2 1 0 win, wins away from home, Andy. So, so City were digging them out. They weren't out playing everybody, but they were digging these results out. We had the place to do it now, didn't we? We had, we had the place to, to go and grind a, a, a win out. And that doesn't sound very sexy, I know that, but we were in a pretty the unsexy situation at the the, the the foot of the table, but in between those was yeah. was, was was your first goal, Justin. A one-one so. draw with Barnett, which got Mr. Justin Whittle off the mark as a Hull City goal know, scorer. Yeah. There weren't many more after no, that, to be fair. but you know, to feed to come, make your small contribution as far as the, the the goal tally was concerned. So go on then, tell us tell us how many yards away you were. Because I know we went one 0 down. I think it was Ken Charlery scored their first goal, and I think I was marking him when he scored. So I thought, well, I've got to make a mention of that. <laughs> I remember, I think I toe poked it out of the keeper's hands from a corner. And I think it just looped over and just tri trickled over the line. Was, Very modest yeah, of you. Are you sure it wasn't a, a carbon wasn't a copy power. of John Whitney's goal? No, it wasn't a power blast. It was just a fortunate toe, toe poker. The keeper, I think he just came to get it and I just managed to get there before him and poked it in. But it was... It was a home. We should have been looking to win our own games, really. Mm. Right? But the point was, was but okay. Having yeah. said that, we, either side of that were one nil wins away from home at Darlington. And Darlington if you'd drawn one of those, then you'd have been a happy yeah. man, wouldn't you? Darlington was a massive win for us because they they obviously had the it was at their old stadium. The Featums. Yeah, George Reynolds was obviously <laughs> still yeah still still in charge, and they they was because they had spent big money. They had obviously Marco W. Dean was up from. Wow, yes, he was. Day. And they also had ex all city players came alone from Stoke. Um, Very funny, Jim McVie was here now. He'd tell us straight away. Yeah, no, I don't think it'll come to me. Mick Race. Uh, he went to, was it Scunny as well? Scunny. Martin Carruthers. Martin Carruthers mm -hmm. was playing for, was up front for Darlington. He came to us from Villa initially. Did, was it? Um, oh, did, he? did Did Carruthers, but he, he was on loan with us. Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, right. Was he playing for Darlington as well? Yeah, That's quite a yeah. strike partnership. So they, that. they were doing really well. I don't know where they were in the league at that time, but I think they were. The bottom half, but they weren't in any particular danger by the looks mm -hmm. of things. Um, really I just want to go back to the Brentford game. Um, yeah. The nature of that win, but also then finding out when you got back into the dressing room afterwards that you'd come off the bottom of the table. I mean, without going overboard, could you actually f could you actually feel the tide turning? Was there, was was there a celebratory atmosphere in the dressing room after that game? A little bit, but the, the way we were controlled. Playing, yeah, then. yeah, definitely. We we didn't we know we couldn't get carried away because it can soon turn around and backfire on you. As indeed it did because of what what happened at Rochdale yeah. afterwards. But but 
the, the, the significance of that see. game, you could see what, what was going on. Yeah, without a doubt, you know, we had the right players, and we, and we had grafters, we definitely had mm. that many grafters in the, in the team, and we had the one or two that could finish, and a little bit of magic, obviously, with, with David Brown, mm. calling our side, the people that could put the ball in there. We, we were prepared to do as much work as it took to get us out of the division, and the, the players, you know, okay, if someone didn't work as hard in training as us, it wasn't a problem as long as they did, they did it on a match day. They, put, they scored the goals or they did whatever they needed. They put a great ball in. We did a great cross, a great tackle. Mm. You know, everyone did their bit for that course. And, and it was such such a good team spirit with the players that we had. And we did have a laugh as well. It wasn't all serious. You know, we had Joe Brabs, mm. John Whitney. We had so many divvies in the team. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't... You, you couldn't beautifully, you couldn't, beautifully put. Subtly put. You couldn't... You couldn't you, you couldn't be serious because you just had too many funny people in the, too many funny players in the side. City finished that month twenty third still, so still only a point, a, a place off the bottom of the table. But now five clear of Scarborough, although they still had to come to Boothbury Park. And we go into March and we start again, Les, with three wins in a row. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, this this thing. Uh, I, I want to ask you as we think about these three wins because it was at the start of seven unbeaten. It was Orient, Plymouth, Plymouth and South End. Um, late winning goals in two of the games, one from David Brown, one from David Doria. But at what point was the phrase the great escape coined, do you think? Was it during this period as, as the, the big Scarborough game was I starting to, to approach? I remember it, you know, where they were doing the thing in the newspaper where they were like photoshopping people's heads on Steve McQueen and riding, you know, like uh, Jason Perry riding motorbikes and stuff. I think that was sort of in the run up to the Scarborough mm-hmm. game because there was a really massive game feel to it. So, I mean, after we'd uh, beaten Halifax, there was a bit of a donut hall, wasn't there, where we drew. Uh, against Mansfield and then we lost to Cambridge but that's when we then went on, a, on another unbeaten run. I, I must admit I don't remember a great deal about the, the games at Ori and, and Plymouth but just looking back at the statistics it, it's remarkable how many girls Brabin chipped in with. It's good really. goals. But what, wasn't the Orient one like an, an overhead kicker? Yeah. Yeah. Isaac Newton physics defying <laughs> I was body cut in position but it was a, that was another tough game that was a, we went mm. to Orient and we played ever so well that was similar to Brentford Mm. Warm day, fantastic, good good crowd. Good team or in where they Yeah, it was and I just remember that being a really tough game. They were they were doing quite well as well, I think. And we just went there, not everyone expecting us, you know, they not to come over anything and but it was a, a fantastic one 0 win. I think now now they were trying to think who scored that that might have been David Brown. Brown and Brabin scored against against Dorian, and then it was Brabin got the winner against Plymouth, so he scored in two straight games. Mm-hmm. What about the away win at South End? That was a goal by David Doria, one 0 win. Yeah, that, 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 assisted. Uh, oh, you, oh, here we go. Assisted. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing up there. Was the... well, I think it was a set piece that you flicked. No, no, it, oh, right. I don't know what it was. It might have been a set piece, and it came back out to me on the left hand side, and I and I, well, I just crossed it. He happened to be on the end of it. I didn't. Know. It could have gone anywhere, but he happened to be it went near him. And he put it away. To we, don't, we haven't mentioned him much. He was a good was, player, I like Doria. The, I like the, the he was a good player. Yeah, he, he was a good, he strong player at numerous clubs at, at, around the bottom of the of the season as a free transfer. Um, and you know, a, a lot of the lot of the players that had started the season with us got churned up and sort of you know sort of booted out. But Doria stuck in there. I remember mm. Warren Joyce saying that he felt after that game. There was a sense on the team bus coming over from the players that they thought we've done it now. We know we know we're going to stay up. Was that was that the case? Possibly, yeah. You know, I I don't think like that. I, you know, I take every every game as it comes. I never mm-hmm. get carried away. I never get up and down. I'm just sort of like stay like that. I never okay. share my emotions. I never really get to. Fair enough. Flat le- le- Somebody le- on Periscope's just quoted the Doria in Excelsis uh, song. I would have thought that Laura Branigan's Gloria might have uh, mm. turned into a good David Doria song. Um, Everything was, even though we, we were playing well and, and the, climbing the table and starting to look like the, 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 um, the new signings and the new manager had, had done what was required of them, there was still the game against Scarborough to come. And, and the build-up was, you know, it was, it was one of the biggest build-ups to a, a Hull City League game for quite a long time, wasn't it, Andy? Yeah, I think it even exceeded the, the hype that came before that Cardiff game, that so-called last game earlier in the season. It felt like the one where if we won that game, it really was ours. We really were safe because the gap would have just been too much for Scarborough, who were clearly in trouble. They'd started, they'd, they'd really fallen down in the last few weeks, and we had that feeling that yeah, if we can win this one, 
It's, it's absolutely there, sorted for us. There were 5,000 more people at the ground that day than there were for that Cardiff game, which was mm. which was 8,500, well, which was still un... That's, even, that's if you go with the official... Yeah, they, that's, that's very Alamish, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I climbed over two walls to get into Boothroom Park that day. I don't remember paying. Apologies, I can still hand over my four quid if you <laughs> like. How? No, because at that you point... You sickened me now. <laughs> well, no, it's because, the, the, it's because the, they yeah, did, really sure. did not have enough people <laughs> or enough open turnstiles to cope with the demand. Oh, yeah. And Well, I'll tell you where else I was. What else happened? I was in the southeast corner, which hadn't officially been open since 1976. Um, but they allowed yeah. a, a smattering of supporters to just walk and sit on the crumbly old, <laughs> old uh, terraces there because there was nowhere else for them to go. Um, 30, I mean, don't forget, when we played Liverpool in 89, that was a capacity crowd of 18,000, but the southeast corner was shut. Um, so I don't know why... 13,949, where else had been closed? Was was the Kempton open by this stage? It must have been, we surely. Yeah, well, Kempton was heaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But bear, bear in mind the year before, Warren Joyce had celebrated uh, to an empty Kempton. It had been redone and reopened yeah. and, and got its safety certificate back. The game was delayed, wasn't it? Yeah, to let everyone... Did that help or hinder? I don't know, because I was injured. I had to watch from the stand as well, and I was in the main stand, and obviously... It was shaking. It was shaking. There's not many people because all the bird crap was falling on me. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember looking over thinking, what was going on? But Did it you was quite great. <laughs> it was such an old joke. <laughs> it was an unsatisfying 1 1 draw in the end. Know, an incredibly an anti climactic occasion, yeah, wasn't no it? Indeed, from Gareth Williams. Uh, I think it was officially Ooh. credited to Jamie yeah. Hoyland, but I think Gareth, yeah. I remember Gareth Williams scoring an own goal against York. Oh, um, yes. That might have been the following year. Mm -hmm. um, no, there was. Um, because Brab scored with a header yeah, in the first half the at, at the North Stand, but they equalised in the second half. Graham Atkinson was playing for Scarborough that day, yeah. and I think he took a corner, and I think it was I think it went down as a Jamie Hoyland goal. Yeah, um, but so. it, and it was only about 12 minutes or something from the end of the match. To give Scarborough the, the due, they, they scrapped that. It was, a, yeah, they probably deserved a point. I, I think City's players were just blinded by their god awful kick. It, <laughs> it, it, it was a, it was it was like a green, the, the kind of green that you have ah, to yeah, you know <laughs> operate on somebody and and, and puncture a bile duct. It's like the, <laughs> the only time you ever see that kind of colour. We, we talked about this game in in such sort of exalted terms because of who the opposition were. Let's bear in mind for for to get the context right for those who weren't around twenty years ago. Scarborough were bottom of the table. They were our biggest rivals through most of that season in terms of trying to avoid the drop because back. And only one team dropped into the non-league. Mm. And they were level on points with um, with Hartlepool. There was Carlisle and then there was us and there was Southend. And uh, we were the ones... It was basically one from... It was going to become one from five. Victory over Scarborough would have taken us, I think, nine points clear of Scarborough. As it was, it was a one-all draw. And because other results didn't quite go our way, there was still an awful lot of work to do. And But I think, at the same time, while the Scarborough game was obviously important as a game in itself, and also because of the gap we could open on the opposition if we happened to beat them, there was still a lot of football still to be played yeah, in the event, of a, in, in, in the event in. of a City victory. There was still a lot for City to do, wasn't yeah, there? There were a lot of games left to play in April. Um, we also knew that we were going to card it next to a top, so the one that, 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 that gap between us and Scarborough had the potential to but that finish finished, quickly. But that also finished 1-1, which was a 1-1 draw that we were absolutely thrilled with. Remember Allside's goal? At Cardiff. That was alright, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember it. He, uh, he smote it into the top corner from about 30 yards. There was only about 200 City fans on that massive was terrace. Was it Whitney-esque? Although in open play rather than a set piece? Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, that, that, Les, was the game where the um, police set, just set dogs into that elbow. Oh, yeah, yeah, they were, like, they were like chucking tiles over the stand that as well. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was, there was this guy who... <laughs> Ran towards the minibus um, and, and was giving it this, and, and people were like motioning to get out the minibus to go remonstrate. Um, <laughs> but, have but, a constructive discussion. <laughs> but, but a police dog just materialised and ate. Just, just ate him. <laughs> can I can I can I point out this point that in my slightly anal way, the phrase "ros dog" was Ros used dog. on Iamba Nectar forums, and I've never forgot that. I thought that was brilliant. And a police officer apparently gave this guy the people's elbow while the dog was eating him as well. <laughs> Um, and that was a great point, that, because we'd, we'd slipped, it felt like we'd slipped up slightly against Scarborough, yeah. and then we'd remedied it by getting some against the team who was top. 
There was just one win that month. That was against Exeter. There were four draws and a rather annoying 3-2 home defeat to Scunthorpe. And, was and Scun fly in the Sc Scunthorpe were... Uh, they'd been top of the table. They were in the playoff positions. And even though things were completely different between the two clubs in terms of the differing ambitions, uh, you know, there was still an awful lot of local pride to be had in giving Scunthorpe mm -hmm. the once-over. And they did the double-overs that season. They did. They were better than us, I think, weren't they? They had a good team, some good players. Um, was that when Lee Hodges was... He was a good a player. Good yeah, well, Cabo they had a, yeah. was, Andy Dawson they, was playing was, for them. John, yeah. about two nil up or three nil up in the first twenty minutes because obviously we couldn't deal. They shell shocked us with Johnny Air, mm. John Gale up from Johnny Air, and they had players like the, Gareth Sheldon, didn't they? Yeah. And uh, you mentioned Calvo Garcia. Yeah, they had. Uh, I can't remember the little lad that played for us. Was he at Grimby? He played for us as well. Forrester. Jamie Forrester. Mm. Mm. We couldn't deal with them three. Mm. I really liked Jamie Forrester. Even when he played for Scunthorpe, I thought he's a he's a, yeah. he's a Rolls yeah. Royce of a player. Looks clever. The, yeah, he was a clever player. The key game did come as the last game in April. This was the third one before the end of the season. Goalless draw against Brighton, who were in the bottom half of the table, although it looked like they were going to be safe. And as a consequence of Scarborough not winning that day, we were now safe in every way except for goal difference. So it, it, there, was, there was a point still to be had from the last two games. But City had uh, nine points. By the end of the, the month, by the end of March, uh, sorry, by the, end of, um, by the end of April, City had nine points on Scarborough and um, a plus 14 better in terms of goal difference. So there was an awful lot for Scarborough to turn around <laughs> if they were going... They still... They, City only had two games left, but Scarborough did have three. So they could still have caught us up points-wise, but they would have had to do so while relying on themselves to score a bundle and for us to concede a bundle. I think Scarborough turned their attention to Carlisle at that point. Yeah. That was the team they were more likely to overhaul. Um, it didn't feel they had any opportunity to, to drag us in now. But after the draw at Brighton, did we celebrate? Did, what did you, what no, was it like after you drew at Brighton? As, well, I remember Brighton because they played at they played at Gillingham. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, because the bus left me. That was the day. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the day. What do you mean you left me on the way there or on the way out? No, it left me. Obviously, we got went to a hotel somewhere on the M25 in one of the hotels, and I was in a room on my own, and they, they told me a time to be down. <laughs> Joyce then went and changed it and forgot to tell me. <laughs> so the bus had gone without me. So I came out, no one there. Oh, what do we do now? And then all of no a sudden. No mobile phones back then, no, children. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> this big Rolls Royce comes behind me, blue one, with the same driver. Door comes down. Why are you meant to be on the bus? <laughs> They've gone without me. It was Inchcliffe and Buchanan. Oh no! <laughs> I had to jump in the Rolls Royce with them. They took me. They took me. Ooh. They took me. Ooh, fly, fly on the, uh, in, was... in the on the steamed inside window. What was the car? Yeah, like? it was. Well, I thought the Cray twins was like. Oh, yeah, I don't know if I should go in here or not. <laughs> was was there a small talk conversation? <laughs> there was, a, yeah, was the saying. Uh, Did they call you I Skipper? Asked, I asked for a pay rise. But <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh uh, dear, but uh, you know that was the point, though that the, the point, literally yeah. and figuratively, when City were safe because Scarborough were never going to catch City up, um, and uh, ultimately there was only one team going to go down. So it was about the the twenty fourth yeah. side catching up everybody else, and they could no mm. longer catch up City. But City then played Torquay to absolutely confirm mm. safety, Andy. That was a real party that day. I seem to remember. Um, we were, that that the great escape uh, theme had very much kicked in there, and I remember the whole stand, even the West Stand. Joining in with it, which was well, they put their flasks down, did they? They did. It was a collector's item mm. in those days because it was a more it certainly it was. was a more refined clientele in there, I think. Um, but although they used Scott, to get they used to get showered in dust every time the balls yeah, before the game yeah. used to get kicked against the roof. Is that when was, did, did Warren Jones sign a new contract on the pitch before that game? Oh, he might well, like, now because yeah, there possibly. was and can you remember who can you remember who Brown scored against or who was in goal for Torquay? Neville Southall. Yeah, it was I Neville. I remember. Of course, he was huge. Yeah, I remember, I remember the big net. There'd been a banner up in, in bunkers for quite a few weeks saying give Joyce a contract, hadn't there? Um, I mean, w was it always going to be the case that Joyce would only get the job full-time if he if he kept City up? I mean, was that the, the, the one and only... I don't think aim? the owners said anything. There, there was not much communication... Um, Do you think this, it's a bit like a Solskjaer thing now, where he might be, have done Joyce might have done better than they expected, and now they feel obliged to give him the job in the way that there seems to be a, a bit more of a clamour for Solskjaer to get the Man United job now well, because he's doing better than expected. The other thing is there was, there was changes going on in the boardroom, so I, yeah. I think um, 
I think Joyce was Tom Belton's appointment, yeah. and, and as the season drew on, the sort of machinations and and sort of Bel uh, Belton was uh, give, given the heave and, and, and other people took over. Um, so perhaps perhaps there were people there that were maybe looking to bring in their own man or whatever, mm. because you know they, the the reason they gave for getting rid of Joyce in the next season was flimsy. They said, oh, well, you know, the, at the end of the season it was promotion form, so we expected that promotion form to carry on, which is a bit of a ridiculous yeah. thing to say. You need to have a consolidation period before you go from, yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> fourth division relegation <laughs> favourites to, you know, a team yeah. that's going to go up the other way. Um, so I, I think it had more to do with that, really. And um, what was it like after the talkie game and when it was absolutely confirmed? What was it like in the, the dressing room and what did you do that night? <laughs> I can't remember much. I think we didn't get drunk very often, but I'm sure I got drunk that night. But I'm sure Brad did. Was, <laughs> yeah. But no, it was a massive relief, you know, in that you're not going to get, you know, everyone wants to stay in the Football League. No one wants to, to go out of that Football League because it's a big decision. Presumably, you, you didn't that. join thinking I'm going to play in conference no, football. Of you, don't. You, you join thinking that you, you want to play and you want to do the best for your team and you won't, you won't do that. And we achieved that. Did you have a get out clause if City had got relegated? No. So you would have carried on as a conference yeah, yeah. player the following season, right? And then it, Swansea on the last day, which was a two 0 defeat. Well, that was, and, and no, nobody, nobody, I mean, where was Swansea in the table? A, we had to play it, didn't we? Because it absolutely got it chucked it down. So the game got delayed. It did get delayed. Yeah, yeah. The game got because delayed. during the delay, we was hearing about the stuff that was going on. Because they something to do with Alabama. their promotion, wanted it they, as well. It was something to do with their promotion. They, they, yeah. they got the last playoff place yeah, as that's a consequence some, of beating City. It was something to do with that. That's why we had to play it. Because yeah. of course it's top seven in in um, in the bottom division, isn't it? Top three go. But the problem was they knew what they had to do. You see, they knew what they had to do. Yeah, yeah. You see, so it was, it was a, a bit. It all felt a little bit wrong, that. that yeah. How, how do you delay a match when a pitch is waterlogged? It's either waterlogged and you don't play we it. To, no, we had to just wait until it, if it was there till whatever time, until the water finally they got rid of it. We had to play it that day. It was an unfriendly atmosphere that day, I seem to remember. It was, because we, we was on holiday, one with the next day. <laughs> 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 the, the, the thing is, at the other end of the table, which City now had, had little to do with, um, the week before, Carlisle had gone below Scarborough and suddenly um, it was a three-horse race. Hartlepool were also still in the mix on the last day, although they looked very likely to stay up. They, were, they had to lose heavily and the other two to both win. Um, but Carlisle were at the bottom, Scarborough were above them, and I remember an interview on whatever the... the was it the Nationwide League at the time? It was, wasn't it? There was a Nationwide League special on a Friday night and they interviewed the three uh, managers of those three clubs and there were, all three of them asked, who will go down? including their own clubs. And only Chris Turner, who was manager of, Carl of uh, Hartlepool, uh, made a prediction and he said, Carlisle will go down. And of course he was wrong because, I mean, we could all have a good laugh at Scarborough mm -hmm. at this stage, although it was sad for... Oh, and we did. Yeah. We yeah. did. We were howling with laughter at Scarborough's we, misfortune. We heard about that listening to Five Live on the bus home, the very delayed bus home from... That from Jimmy Swansea. Glass, the Carlisle on-loan goalkeeper, had scored... Because Carlisle were down at quarter to five and stayed up at ten to because they had a lot of injury time. And sent their goalkeeper up at 1-1 one, one to, um, to attack a corner because they had to win because Scarborough hadn't. And, um, and he scored a goal that's going to make him memorable forever. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, yes, you can laugh at Scarborough and, 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 and indeed still do. But Scarborough, 20 years on, have never shown any kind of recovery. Oh, no. So Scarborough as a place was delighted that they'd got relegated. They, 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 they tried... Football mm. league, uh, football in the, in their town as if it was a big inconvenience. And I'm just laughing. You know, he was asking if it was the nationwide league. Somebody pointed out that you've got their logo on your sleeve. Oh right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was then. Yeah, fair point. I, hadn't, I hadn't noticed. I hadn't noticed it. Well, I was just. I'm asking mm. so-called experts. Yeah. You see, it on this mm. time. So City finished the season 21st. 46 games, 14 wins, 11 draws, 21 defeats, 44 goals scored, 62 conceded. Uh, a goal difference of minus 18, final points tally of 53, five clear of Scarborough, uh, who went down. They conceded 77 goals and had a minus 27 um, goal difference. So, job done? Yes, that's what, you know, that's what... The that's what you were signed yeah, for, was it? He <laughs> put pen to paper and said, Justin, keep we us won. in League Division 3. That's what all of us did. That's what we wanted to achieve. And the fans definitely helped us, without a doubt. Did either of you two shed a tear over this? Because it was a desperate situation for so long. And, and when you're in that situation, um, you, 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 you know, it, it, it causes all sorts of problems generally, doesn't it? It makes you lose sleep it, it, when it, when it yeah. means that much. It never had that one 
crowning moment of glory in the mm. way that perhaps the 2008 playoff final did as an example because mm. we felt it, we incrementally felt more and more that we were going to be okay especially as as, a, as April came into view and no, we got clear and no one was really catching us so I don't think there was that one moment of glory just a big party at the end of the Torquay game which which was a thoroughly merited and thoroughly deserved what was the relationship Justin that you felt, not just as an individual, but as, as a member of this team, what was your relationship with the fans like during the course of, of this sort of big coming together of, uh, of players and supporters to try and keep the club in, the, in Division 3? I think it got better over the season. Obviously, first game, everyone, I'm not sure about him, we don't really know him. And then obviously, as the, as the more you play, as the season goes on, mm. that bond and that togetherness get stronger and stronger. Could you feel the togetherness between the whole squad and the fans? Oh yeah, without a doubt, definitely. There's obviously one or two players that the fans weren't that keen on, which now and again you can tell, but join <laughs> <laughs> Very subtly <laughs> put again. <laughs> but but that season they really got behind everyone because we know any negativity was, was would put a bit of a downer on the on the spirit and the way mm. we were playing, but you know, everyone did a job that season. They did. I mean, 35 players were used in league games that season. There were a few more used mm. for cup ties um, as well. David Doria made most appearances. He um, played 42. Uh, David Brown played 38 and came on in four more. Mike Edwards played 28 and came on in two more. Uh, I mean, what a season for Mike Edwards. I mean, he was still only 20 years old when the... Uh, no, he wasn't. He was, um, he was 18 20, years old yeah. when the season started. And, and 28 games in a... In a, in a, in a Put put into a situation like that. I mean, did you have any? Did because you, you had Mark Greaves there, who was a little bit older than Mike Edwards, but still a young, inexperienced lad who'd been there a bit longer. He'd been there since Terry Dolan's time as manager. But did you have any? Um, was any part of your remit when you arrived, and then when John Whitney and Jason Perry arrived to bring these guys on a bit more as 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 defenders? No, but you always try to do that anyway. As an experienced one of being one of the more experienced defenders, mm. you naturally do that. You know, you're always trying to improve their game. They're always trying to improve their game. They want to get better. But the only way you improve is by playing and getting experience. To be 18 and 19 years old in that season, to play 28 times and to be part of a, um, a successful team. It's a big, I mean, we're, we're big fans of Mike Edwards anyway. I still think Peter Taylor should have kept him when he, uh, when he let him go. But that's another matter entirely. The... the, the but it was uh, that that actually added a little bit extra that there was this local lad, Hazel Boy, who was in the first team under Hately at the age of seventeen, who was now making a tangible contribution to a serious situation. Well, it was it was a serious situation, but the contributions were were strong ones, weren't they? He wasn't in the team simply because we'd run out of players. I, th I, I, I thought the young players that season did 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 their bit. It must have been such a horrible situation to be in because bottom of the league. You're starting out with your football career. That can't be what you want from things. It's not how you imagine it, is it? When you sign schoolboy terms with a club and anything like that. But and also, you've got to remember that you know once Justin had joined, along with Jason Perry and John Whitney, suddenly there are five defenders going forth most of the time, only four places, and Mike Edwards ends up with 28 matches. I mean, you know, it would have been easy to drop the inexperienced kid at that point, wouldn't it, Les? But Warren Joyce didn't, so not very often, anyway. Yeah, and what, the other thing that Warren Joyce did as well is. Um... The, the, there were players that he that weren't performing before he was manager that he got the best out of. I think Doria was one of them, um, uh, and and Brown was another one as well. Yeah, I mean that could have been a season that really retarded the development of the young kids, but it didn't, did it? So I think I think that was uh, was pretty good. I think it's a defense. It's a defense that is talked about in equal terms, albeit for in terms of differing achievement to the the Ricketts, Dawson, Brown, Turner defense of two thousand and eight. I mean, there's four names usually quoted from this season, which are Whittle, Whitney, Edwards, and Greaves, um, as being the defense that was built to keep Hull City uh, in Division Three. And and you know, obviously, players like Swales and Perry. Um, I mean, Swales played 20 games that season, not always at right back probably, but he certainly played 20 games that season. So there were other defenders who made their contribution. And when you consider that we started the season with Neil Whitworth and, and Gregor Rioch in, uh, in defence, and the previous season we'd had Ian Wright and Tony Bryan, it was, it was, it was different gravy, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think my, my favourite take from, from that is that Rioch didn't play again. That, that, that gratifies me. He, he came on as a sub late on a couple of times in the season just because there was an injury crisis of, um, of some description. You played 24 games in the end. I mean, you said you got an injury at some point during that season it's notable given that Joyce took over in, in November brought in six or seven players over the next couple of months that quite a lot of them um, you, yourself Gareth Williams uh, late, late further down the line Gary Brown uh, John Whitney and Steve Swales were among the, the 
the, the players who made the most appearances that season. So the turnover of players was huge, and the complete gutting of the squad and starting again was quite substantial, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, we the players that he brought in definitely played played a lot of games. Mm. Especially, obviously, couldn't tell went there from from November December. You know, the players he brought in did do a job. So it just goes to show that he, the players he brought in definitely contributed. You know, we didn't. We didn't have many players that he brought in that he didn't use, mm. or was a bit part. Everyone played their part, definitely. But well, even the players that were there. Mm. I mean, look at well, Matt Hawkins is a good example. Yeah. He's, he's still, I mean, he's he's got all these defenders arriving who are clearly going to shove him out the side mm. at some point, and he still ended up with twenty four appearances that season. Yeah, Matt Hawkins looked like he could have been a good player at one stage. Didn't he, he started the season well, mm. um, but I suppose it was a, a, an easy season for a young defender to have the confidence. Knacked, I guess. Yeah. Steve Wilson made 23 goalkeeping appearances. Uh, there was Gibson in goal for a four games that season oh, on yeah. loan, and then Andy Oakes arrived and, and played a lot towards the end. Brian McGinty played 22 that season, and he, he doesn't get mentioned much. I, I, I don't remember a lot about Brian McGinty, but I do remember he was always very, very good on Championship Manager during that period. He used to score a lot of goals as an attacking mm. midfielder. Um, I, he's, he's not a player we mentioned. We haven't mentioned him at all, really, in this. What, what was he like? He was all right, but he never he used to come on a sub a lot, didn't he? he was sub, mm. but. He obviously mm. played a lot of his games before before I got there, so I only. He was saw... a hateful signing. He came from Rangers, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. So. You yeah. Know, but he, you know, I think he, I think he might have scored the hat trick against Liverpool. He, he scored, he scored two, two, didn't he? He scored two. Brown two and, and McGinty two. Yeah, he looked he looked like a player with a, a good bit of talent, but he seemed to be missing a yard of pace even as a young player, yeah. and maybe a yard of application every now and then. I don't know if that's, but if that's unfair or not. But he didn't really like fit it. into our style of play at that point. At that. At that time, Hungary. yeah, it <laughs> wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't you know. well, one thing that is notable is how reliant City really were on David Brown for goals, oh. though. He scored 11, which is a decent tally for a team that was essentially a non scoring side until until Warren Joyce took over. McGinty, Dory, and Brabin got four each. Um, Alside and Haightley got three, and then Dudley, Joyce, Peacock, and Whitworth got two. There was one each for Messrs Bonner, Hocking, Whitney, Whittle, and Williams, and that was our goal-scoring tally for the entire season. It wasn't a lot. I mean, the Hartlepool game was was a, was a glorious exception to to. I mean, when City did score, they 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 tended to win by the odd goal, didn't they? Yeah. That's how we stay up, isn't it? It's well, not... that's how we, yeah. That's how we that's how we got our wins. We, we a solid defence, and if we could nick a goal here and there with the players. Outside, grabbing on, on Brown, that's what we did. You know, if we went one up, we made sure we stayed one. Did you always fancy it? Yeah, we never looked like we were going to score again, but we, you know, <laughs> we, we knew that we weren't going to let a goal in. And that's how, you know, that's how a lot of our games were. And teams didn't like playing against us. Uh, as as proved, yeah. I mean, uh, it's not. I mean, uh, winning enough games in the end to stay up fourteen of them, but you blooded quite a few noses towards the top end of the table. It wasn't just the teams around and about um, that um, that Hull City beat in order to get out of the the um, the mess they were in and, and finished twenty first in the table. Um, just a final few thoughts then. Um, once that season was over and you could settle into a, a break over the summer, what what was the next? Aim, do you think? I mean, we, we talked, Les has mentioned what the, the slightly wild um, yeah. expectations that, that Buchanan and uh, Hinchliffe had for, for Hull City under Warren Joyce, but what do you think from within the dressing room was the expectation for the next season? I don't know. If we could, from a personal point of view, I think if we would be happy mid table, if we could make the playoffs, it would be a fantastic achievement. But, you know, obviously the hype was the promotion, and, and I think. For whatever reason, we got, we maybe got too carried away with that. But when Warren Joyce was dismissed, because he, he lasted until the April, didn't he? Because Brian Little only took charge on the last day of the next mm. season. Mm. When he did go, was it unfair? Yeah, possibly. We, we thought a big, a big disappointment. You know, he, he brought in a few players. Obviously, Jason Harris he brought in. <laughs> didn't really, is that the best players. you can come up with? <laughs> well, he, brought in, really, he, brought, he brought in, <laughs> in Goodison, 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 Goodison and, and Whitmore. Whitmore. Yeah. He brought in certainly Jamie Wood. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think the Great Escape season had a long term impact yeah. um, because I think people in Hull had gotten sick of the decline at Hull City, and this was the absolute nadir of that decline. And it took that for people in the city to realise how important having I mean, a professional club was. And, you know, when you have games where there's Fourteen thousand on the on the books, but there's probably seventeen or eighteen thousand yeah. there. You know, for a bottom division game against two of the worst teams in it. You know, that shows you that there's a real hunger in the city for for the for the team to do well. 
I think Lloyd constantly mentioning the, a super stadium and then somehow when he sold the club this season to extricate Boothry Park from the club, how the hell he, how that went unheralded hmm. at the time I don't know, but it was that that set probably had the council on a pass to thinking we may, we may need to build a municipal stadium once we sell the mm. when once we sell half the telephone company. So that I think was something that came out of it. You know the the acceleration of plans of having a stadium okay. in the city mm. um, shared by two two professional clubs, and also it was only a year and a half till Adam Pearson bought the club. So you have to think when City were getting eight thousand against Cardiff and, and seventeen thousand against Scarborough, that's going to be the kind of thing that must have somebody's attention mm. and said there's real potential in that city to do well so seventh biggest city in England and a, a, a rare I mean there's not many I mean Leeds and Newcastle are bigger cities than Hull with only one club but there's not many really big cities in England that are only one club cities yeah. um, but we have no heritage and no history so nobody had noticed us but then when as you, you particularly the Scarborough game and obviously the Scarborough game the reason people were there because of the importance of the fixture in terms of what was going to happen to the team tomorrow and next week the long term ramifications as you say of having a, 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 a very high by comparison to the, the normal average official attendance mm -hmm. not to mention a very obviously high unofficial attendance made made all the difference to, to those who, who perhaps had been a bit sort of naysaying as far as um, City's future was concerned as a, as a footballing city and, and of course the Rugby League we still had, despite the fact that... Hull, oh, Hull, Hull, yeah but, but everyone, <laughs> everyone outside of the City of Hull was still saying it's a rugby city I think it changed our perception of ourselves a little bit as well because as, as, as odd as it seems, the for, for quite a while, the 98-99 the season was the best one I'd ever seen. Even uh, though it was statistically one of the worst. It was the second worst, I think, in our entire history. But the fact that it ended in such a on such a high made you think, well, there must be more to this club than just a decline that had started a decade earlier. Can, can we actually get ourselves sorted one day? It didn't happen the next season. I, I always felt really bad for Warren Jones because I, I would have loved, loved him to have been the man who took us up a division or even more than that and I'm sure he had it in him but it, it, it never happened but Would Warren Joyce have flourished under Adam Pearson? Everybody would have flourished under Adam Pearson Jan Mulby didn't Phil, Every, Par Phil Parkinson didn't Everyone who's not Jan Mulby <laughs> Or Phil <laughs> Parkinson <laughs> Okay um, You went on to play for Brian Little again um, I, I, now that we, I wasn't fully aware that it was Brian Little who sent you to Hull City from Stoke in the first place. So what was that like, just as a as a last aside? Um, when he walks through the door, the man who who'd sent you to Hull City eighteen months earlier. I said to my wife, "Where do you want to move to next?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Darlington. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> no, I think it was it was it, it wasn't a problem. It was different circumstances, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? It wasn't, it wasn't a problem altogether. Yeah, you know, it just happens sometimes. If managers. We're not keen, you're keen on you at the time. Uh, anybody yeah. want to mention A, Peter Taylor, B, Mark Joseph, or C, uh, Alan <laughs> Shearer at this point before we finish? <laughs> Evidently well, not. scores on me already. <laughs> well, Justin, if you, if you, I don't know whether you can see it on the screen. Justin's got the reason why we didn't do this is scheduled last week. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's his private life, but he <laughs> ulti <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, Justin had a, an accident. Well, you can tell us if you like, but he's got a scar, a bit like Alan Hansen's scar oh, from when he is. fell through a plate glass window at the age of 14 that you see on TV every time he was on Match of the Day. But uh, you, you just had a funny turn, didn't I you? Know, yeah. <laughs> but it's nothing to do with Alan. Shearer. <laughs> it isn't because he met Alan Shearer in a darkened room. And if it was, you should have seen the size of the scar on Alan Shearer's forehead. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bit you know what I love that you get um, you get fetid for for, um, for for that activity with Alan Shearer but we've got to remember you were Even a bloody Grimsby player <laughs> you were a Grimsby <laughs> player when, when apparently Shearer was going to stick one on you and everyone was going yeah if he tried <laughs> did you ever get sent off playing for City? yeah what dodgy two dodgy ones one Dwayne Derby away at um what would that have been if it was a Dwayne Darby after he'd left us? Was that North, the team near Northampton, you know, Rushton Diamonds? Right, yes, of course. Oh, oh yeah, that 3-3 game. Yeah, I got sent off. Was that there. when Mike Edwards scored an own goal and the ball smacked him in the face? <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, it might right. have been. It was the one where Gary Alexander scored a goal from a different postal code <laughs> and I missed it <laughs> because of an obnoxious steward that wanted yeah. me to move. Then I got ah. sent off against, I think it was... Kidderminster, last we drew one all last kick. I think it was Kidderminster at home, someone's just yeah. put up there. Mm -hmm. Kidderminster got. I won the ball. Definitely won That's the ball. You, you we keep telling yourself that. Them. <laughs> yeah, got turned down. <laughs> so a couple of a couple of suspensions as a yeah, result. Yeah, yeah, last man, both of them, last man. 
And we, we need to mention the fact that you're still here in Hull. I mean, you... you because you didn't go straight to Grimsby from here, did you? Yeah. You did, okay. So <laughs> yeah. that, that, that helps, obviously. You don't have to move <laughs> yeah. house. But and, and I remember Andy and a couple of our friends, Joe Atkinson, who, um, uh, who, be, who is your biggest fan. He's the guy who turned up at KCFM and got you to sign his shirt and I took your photo and everything else. Um, and also Chris Whiting going to see you playing for Ferriby and you were on the bench and didn't actually get on. <laughs> so you ended up playing for, you even ended up playing for Ferriby, which is fantastic. The fact that you laid down some roots here. Because you were already married when you were living in Stoke, so you could have quite easily gone anywhere after Hull City and had to lay down roots again. But the fact that you're still in the area, um, I think um, we said this to Brian Hughes when he came to talk about the playoff uh, final um, of ten years ago over the um, over the summer. It's nice, it's always good to see when a player who isn't originally from the area after he's finished his association with the club uh, carries on living in Hull. It, it's it's so you, you obviously settled quite quickly oh, yeah, on, a, on a domestic level. Yeah, easy. I've got two girls now. What? Well, I've got two girls. One's Holly Gully, one's from Derby. So uh, there's a bit of rivalry between those, those two. And you captained the um, the the seven aside team on uh, on Sky as oh, well. Oh yeah, that was. I think Les has got one of your shirts from that, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, got yeah, two, yeah. right? Okay. That was good. That was good fun. Unfortunately, then we, we did get slaughtered in every game. I know. Though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> recruiting some really old faces. I mean, Lee Jenkinson played in that, which yeah. was uh, <laughs> which was which was remarkable. Was um, round, but to be fair, there's a lot of players that made the choice of picking, and obviously, I didn't know more then. <laughs> but I do now. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> so, tell us what you're up to now. I'm still post been placement now for ten years. It'll be ten years in March I've since I've last. Do you get a testimonial? In... Well, I'm <laughs> open. I'm trying. But you're not having it. They'll <laughs> pay you in stamps. You get a sort of thing. You get a stamp. You get a postal order. Saying, well done. <laughs> On it, but I've been in that now in Ellington Brook where I lived for 10 years. And I bet I you don't I'm get attacked by dogs if you know it's just in Whittler's de delivering their post. <laughs> now and again, I do, but not very often. They're, they're not bad, they're not bad, bad dogs in Brook. They're always, they're always on leads. <laughs> That's a beautiful turn of phrase. They're always, they're always on leads. <laughs> no wild dogs running around. Do you go to Hull City? <laughs> yes, I do. Do you have any corporate involvement? Do you do yes. any of the uh, entertainment, entertainment and hospitality yes. and stuff? I still do uh, hospitality. With a few, uh, few ex-players, obviously myself, Andy Savile, mm. Andy Skipper, Stan McEwen. Ooh, you're, the, you're, the, you're the youthful prodigy amongst that lot. <laughs> no, um, do you know, see, Brian uses it now and again when he's mm. available. So there is, and obviously Steve Moran as well. Steve Moran, mm. wow. So there is obviously Rob Jewist, as we'll see now and again, but he, he didn't do the corporate stuff and all that. And has there been any kind of reunion for this? I mean, well... Uh, uh, it's 20 years since The Great Escape. If there hasn't been, are you, are you going to start organising <laughs> no, one now? No, I have got it all about it. I mean, I think we did one, I think it might have been the 10-year one. Mm. But I don't think we've done a 20-year one. And no one's said anything to me yet. So well, uh, you're the one who's, you're the man, <laughs> just the man to organise it. Well, listen, um, I'm sure these guys will want to say it themselves, but on behalf of all of us and everybody who's been watching us on Periscope and are, are now watching us on YouTube or listening to this podcast, it's been great fun to go through it all again. Uh, in one in one sense certainly <laughs> from uh, twenty years ago and to have and to have the the the, the leader the captain one of the best captains we've ever had obviously um, sitting with us um, to talk about it so on behalf of the three of us thank you very much indeed thank for you. coming in we are very very grateful and maybe we'll do all this again in ten years time yes yeah, pleasure <laughs> not a problem I might, I might not be able to remember anything though in ten years <laughs> I'm struggling now <laughs> uh, that was Justin Whittle joining us on a special 200th edition of the Amber Nectar podcast looking back at the Great Escape uh, campaign of 20 years ago when City survived just uh, a relegation into uh, the conference and of course the only way has been up since then